everyone, thank you for coming. Um, this is the final session where we actually get to bring it home and talk about what this means to Santa Clara. Professor, uh, Governor of Washington, John Inslee, said that we're the first generation to feel the sting of climate change and the last generation who can do anything about it. Cardinal Turkson yesterday, and this was alluded to in some of the talks earlier, uh, mentioned how fossil fuels have brought us to an unprecedented standard of living, but how they now threaten to doom all of that. In Laudato Si, Pope Francis writes that we can all work together and we still have, humanity still has the ability to work together to build our common home. And that's what we're here today to talk about. Santa Clara likes to christen itself as the heart of Silicon Valley. And as a Jesuit institution and as kind of a moral guidance in this area of rapid development, what does it mean for us to embrace the ecological conversion that Pope Francis advocates for? And it's for that reason that I bring us all here today. So I'm going, we have three panelists who are going to, uh, professors from the SU community who are going to give us scholarly responses about the implications of this. And then we will go on and open this up to a broader discussion, inviting all of you to talk, to raise questions and where we can enter into a dialogue that I hope will only be the beginning of a longer conversation throughout the rest of the year about Laudato Si. I asked the panelists specifically to respond to this question. What challenges does Laudato Si present in terms of Santa Clara University's commitment to being a socially responsible institution? Specifically, does the encyclical provide direction in terms of the divestment question? First, I would like to invite Chad Raphael, Professor of Communications and a Faculty Associate for Sustainability SCU, to give his remarks. He teaches and writes about environmental communication and helps design campaigns for environmental organizations. He's chaired the board of the Jesse Smith Noyes Foundation, which funds environmental justice work and the Silicon Valley Toxics Coalition. Additionally, he's, helped design, he's chaired committees that have helped design SU's core curriculum and has helped draft Santa Clara's strategic plan. Dr. Chad Raphael. Thanks very much. If you've listened to some of the earlier speakers today, you've heard a lot of themes in the encyclical that could inform our decision making about sustainability. Let me remind you of a few of uh, Pope Francis's greatest hits, at least as I saw them. The climate is a common good, belonging to all and meant for all. Economic interests should not trump the common good. There's an urgent need to develop policies so that in the next few years, the emission of carbon dioxide and other highly polluting gases can be drastically reduced. For example, substituting for fossil fuels and developing sources of renewable energy. The principle of the maximization of profits, frequently isolated from other considerations, reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of the economy. Only when the economic and social costs of using up shared environmental resources are recognized with transparency and fully borne by those who incur them, not by other peoples or future generations, can these actions be considered ethical. I'd like to focus on two themes in particular as they relate to the question of what Santa Clara should be doing about climate change. Trying to act with integrity to resolve our contradictions and taking responsibility for our effect on the climate. Let me start with striving for integrity amidst our contradictions. The encyclical quotes the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew. Inasmuch as we all generate small ecological damage, we're called to acknowledge our contribution, smaller or greater, to the disfigurement and destruction of creation. For human beings to destroy the biological diversity of God's creation. For human beings to degrade the integrity of the earth by causing changes in its climate by stripping the earth of its natural forests or destroying its wetlands. For human beings to contaminate the earth's waters, its land, its air, and its life, these are sins. I'd add that these are sins, even if we use the profits from these activities to fund my research on sustainability, 
or your scholarship to study environmental engineering. If we can't acknowledge this, we can't continue the good work that we've begun on addressing the gap between our values and our actions. The email sent to the campus community last June explaining the trustees' decision not to divest from fossil fuel stocks included some valid arguments for not acting immediately, especially the transaction costs associated with selling shares and funds that invest partially in fossil fuel companies and the scarcity of alternative energy investment funds. To the university's credit, the trustees announced some new investments that align better with our mission than fossil fuels, including renewable energy funds and a new campus sustainability investment fund, which will support projects that reduce our use of energy and water and our greenhouse gas emissions. SCU is not simply a big, fat hypocrite about sustainability. But I'm not sure that the email from the trustee committee was entirely willing to face our ongoing tr contradictions. The email noted that, quote, SCU's investment policy includes respect and preservation of the environment among its five core socially responsible investment principles. And that the trustees committee concluded that on the whole, our current investment strategy is not in conflict with SCU's mission to be an environmental steward. The endowment fund serves as a vital source of student scholarships, endowed professorships, and university resources that ensure the long-term viability of the university, end quote. The endowment is indeed a vital resource, a vital source of support for SCU's vision to educate citizens and leaders of competence, conscience, and compassion, and cultivate knowledge and faith to build a more humane, just, and sustainable world. But supporting these worthy activities with profits from fossil fuel stocks does indeed contradict our aspirations to build a more humane, just, and sustainable world, whether we think that trade-off is worth it or not. At present, the oil and coal companies are major and powerful obstacles to the kind of public policies the Pope calls on us to enact. They fight to preserve public subsidies for fossil fuels and against mandatory reductions in their use. For example, this year the oil companies spent around $16 million to pressure California's lawmakers to kill a provision in a climate change bill that would have mandated a 50% cut in petroleum usage in our cars by 2030. That would have helped create a more sustainable world. Moral maturity means not pretending that it's easy for institutions like ours to practice integrity in this world. We recognize the moral contradictions in our lives and we take steps to try to resolve them, to harmonize our values and our actions, even if we can never do so perfectly. And we don't use the presence of contradiction or the difficulty of eluding it as an excuse not to act to close the gap between all that we value and all that we do. In this light, I think some other arguments that are often made for remaining invested in fossil fuels seem morally weak because they don't address the fundam this fundamental question about our integrity. Can we align our values and our actions better? One of those arguments is that divestment won't affect fossil fuel company stock prices because there, were, or there will always be plenty of other investors who will snap up the shares that we sell. But the fact that my neighbor's hands are dirty doesn't absolve me from trying to wash my own. Another of those arguments is that it isn't worth divesting because only a small portion of our portfolio is in fossil fuels. But the fact that only one of my hands is dirty doesn't absolve me from trying to get them both clean. There are other problems with these arguments too. The strongest argument for divestment isn't that it's gonna punish oil and coal stocks directly, but that it will shift public discourse. That was arguably the biggest effect of the movement to divest holdings in South Africa during the 1980s, which helped build pressure to end apartheid by turning the global, a global spotlight on the country's system of legalized discrimination and brutality against the black majority. And if only a small portion of our investments are in fossil fuels, well then eliminating them wouldn't seem to pose much of a risk to our investment strategy. That seems to be one reason why other universities have found it easier than us to at least dump coal stocks from their portfolios. Here's what Pope Francis says about the second theme I want to discuss, the challenges of taking responsibility for our actions. As often occurs in periods of deep crisis, which require bold decisions, we are tempted to think that what is happening is not entirely clear. Superficially, apart from a few obvious signs of pollution and deterioration, things don't look that serious and the planet could continue as it is for some time. 
Such evasiveness serves as a license to carrying on with our present lifestyles and models of production and consumption. This is the way human beings contrive to feed their self-destructive vices, trying not to see them, trying not to acknowledge them, delaying the important decisions, and pretending that nothing will happen. Now, thankfully, SCU hasn't just buried its head in the sand in response to climate change. Five years ago, one of the most important steps we took was to develop a climate neutrality action plan and commit to reducing our campus community's net greenhouse gas emissions to zero by the end of 2015. But while we've made a lot of progress, we're not going to meet that goal this year. When we realized that we weren't going to make it, we could have taken an easy way out. We could have declared the goal unrealistic and abandoned it, pointed to everything that we'd accomplished, because we'd accomplished quite a bit, and stopped trying to eliminate our remaining emissions, which are the hardest ones to cut. These are emissions from activities like faculty, staff, and student travel, including commuting to campus. That's not going to stop. Or we could have done what some other institutions did, tried to achieve neutrality mainly <clears throat> by buying uncertified and unregulated voluntary emission reductions, carbon offsets, like purchasing shares and replanting a forest somewhere in the developing world, and counting that against our emissions, despite some very real doubts about whether these projects are as effective at reducing carbon as promised, and about the ethics of relying too heavily on paying other people to make up for our emissions before doing all that we can to reduce them ourselves. I'm not saying that carbon offsets should never be considered or will never be considered, only that we haven't and shouldn't reach for them as a first option and not without third-party certification that they're legitimate. Instead, I think we're doing the most responsible thing. We revised our commitment to achieve carbon neutrality by 2020, which is still a lot sooner than many other institutions. And we're taking steps to do it, first through real measures to reduce our own emissions, not just by paying someone else to clean up after us by planting some trees halfway around the world. Oh, and we also committed to producing zero waste in five years. Another ambitious little goal. So SCU is not simply a big fat hypocrite about sustainability. However, as often occurs in periods of deep crisis, which require bold decisions, we are tempted to think that what is happening is not entirely clear. The email that we received last June explained the trustees' decision by arguing that, quote, at this time, only a limited number of universities have opted to divest completely from fossil fuel-oriented companies. Unlike the days of apartheid and its associated divestment movement, no consensus on the wisdom and efficacy of fossil fuel divestment has been reached, even among faith-driven institutions such as SCU. I don't think that's a strong argument against divestment, factually or morally. Factually, there was never a consensus among universities to divest from companies that did business in apartheid-era South Africa. After two decades of student pressure on universities, around 50 educational institutions had divested fully or partially by 1984, which then jumped dramatically to almost 190 institutions in 1988. That was still only around 5% of American higher education institutions. Not a consensus, but a small group of moral leaders. Today, in about three years, the fossil-free movement has persuaded 27 U.S. universities to divest. That's not a consensus either, but it's a rather fast-growing movement of moral leaders. More importantly, whether it's moral or not for us to divest doesn't depend on whether there's a consensus about divestment among other institutions. For over two decades, the oil companies and their friends told us that we shouldn't act on climate change because there wasn't a scientific consensus that it was human-induced and a threat. Now that there is a scientific consensus, and there is, do we really have to wait another couple of decades for still more institutions to establish a moral consensus to divest? I hope not, because I think we'd be abdicating our responsibility to think and act for ourselves. I hope the next phase of our campus conversation will allow us to explore how we can take responsibility for moving not just toward investing in green energy, but away from fossil fuels. Because it isn't guaranteed that increasing solar and wind energy will automatically reduce oil, coal, and gas. The world could simply just use more energy, clean and dirty. And I hope we'll consider how our investment policy might contribute to the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions by doing just what the Pope has recommended quote, substituting for fossil fuels and developing sources of renewable energy. 
While doing our part to hasten this transition in the energy economy is certainly complex, we can keep thinking about setting goals for phasing out our investments in fossil fuels over time, just as we set goals for reducing our own emissions on, on campus over several years. If we think the California bill was reasonable to try to reduce petroleum dependence by, 15 per, by 50 percent over the next 15 years, why not commit now to reducing our own reliance on fossil fuel profits at the same rate or faster? If the state could pass a law this summer requiring its two largest public employee pension funds to divest themselves of coal, the dirtiest of big fossils offerings, would it be too difficult for us to set a date to phase out the, the less than half of 1 percent of our portfolio that's invested in coal stocks? No matter how noble our university's mission, as investors we walk a fine line between fiscally responsible stewardship of our resources and single-minded pursuit of the optimal short-term rate of return for us, but not necessarily for others. While we are not big, fat hypocrites, Pope Francis's challenge applies to our investment policies too. The principle of the maximization of profits, frequently isolated from other considerations, reflects a misunderstanding of the very concept of the economy. Only when the economic and social costs of using up shared environmental resources are recognized with transparency and fully borne by those who incur them, not by other peoples or future generations, can these actions be considered ethical? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raphael. Next, I would like to invite Dr. Oliver Putz. He's to the podium to give his remarks. He's an, associate, uh, an assistant professor of religion and science in the religious studies department here. He actually holds a PhD in biology and um, studying reproductive and evolution, but his attention has since moved to theology. He's currently completing his dissertation in theology on the possibility of non-human animals possessing selfhood and being in species-specific personal relationships with God. In January of 2016, Putz will be leaving SCU to uh, to join the Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies in Germany. While he's there, he'll be do, uh, conducting research on how religions can be incorporated into the global conversation on climate change. Dr. Putz. Okay, give me one second here. I'm just gonna do some eye candy so we all have a little bit of fun with that. And I see stuff that I don't know, okay. Of course, how it always goes, it should go without a glitch, and then you have glitches. But yeah. You're leaving already? Okay, here we go. Yes. All right. So I'm, I'm a theologian, and I will speak as a theologian. I'm not... I'm not an economist. So my remarks will come from a theological corner and specifically from a corner as a theologian who does theology and science. And I think that the uh, encyclical had a lot to say about that and was very helpful there. Theologically, there was not much new there. I hope I don't offend anyone, but there really wasn't. What it was, though, is a new way of saying things that had been said before. 200 pages, that's saying things slightly differently putting a good emphasis on things, right? Um, I want to lift out one thing. I don't think he's telling me I should stand up. I think he's telling me I should speak louder. There, can you hear me better now? Because I don't want to do one of these, okay? Okay, great. All right, so um, I want to lift one thing out here that the Pope wrote in the encyclical. If the present ecological crisis is one small sign of the ethical, cultural, and spiritual crisis, of modernity. We cannot presume to heal our relationship with nature and the environment without healing all fundamental human relationships. I think that's a nice way of framing the issue. This is not a scientific issue. This is actually a cultural issue. It's a spiritual issue and, of course, an ethical issue. So what I want to do here now is I want to look at three possible ways how I would envision that religions, not only Catholicism, 
but religions can actually respond to the ecological crisis. And I want to see how we can maybe apply these things here to our school. The first one would be that the ecological crisis has to be understood and its effects as a problem of faith. I'm not talking here about we're lacking faith. I'm talking about is this a theological issue? Okay, so from within a faith tradition, is that actually something that a faith tradition based on their faith commitments has to be concerned about? Because that would actually inform also how religious people would have to act. Second, I want to speak here about something that I think religions have a lot of experience in, and that is mediate transformation, internal transformation as well as, ex as, as uh, societal transformation. And I want to ask in how far religions can actually offer insights into how such a transformation to more sustainable futures can actually be well, applied, not only to religious people. Okay, So I think there is something that religions can actually offer non-religious people just as well. And then finally, I want to talk about the intersection of religion, science, and politics as a very practical approach to how religions can get involved as one of the major stakeholders in the discussion about what we are to do about this situation. Now, when I say religion is a major stakeholder, that might make you nervous because it's, it's, it's a very diverse stakeholder. It's not a uniform stakeholder, but then which stakeholder is diverse in this conversation? I think this is a problem that requires a transdisciplinary approach, and so I think religion is actually one of the big, um, uh, one of the big groups to, to talk here. Okay, so what do I mean by ecological crisis and its effects as a problem of faith? Well, I'll give you the guiding question here. Must theology as a methodic and systematic reflection and explication of faith consider the nature, cause, and ramification of the ecological crisis, especially in regards to biodiversity loss, climate change, and potential response strategies, such as climate engineering, for example, and devise specific religious actions arising from such a reflection? So the question is really, is this a theological issue or not? If it's not, then, well, sure, religious people should get involved just like anyone else, but is there a special impetus here, perhaps? Okay. And I want to answer that question by saying, yes, absolutely, it is a theological issue. And there are different ways of how we can think about it. We can think about it from a doctrine of creation. We can think about it from various things. But what I think religions have to do, and I think the... Actually, the, the um, encyclical is speaking to that. It is necessary for us to construct a comprehensive theological model of religious responses to the ecological crisis. And that should integrate insights from theology of nature, so nature as creation or sacred or both, theological anthropology, how we understand the human in light of theological commitments, and moral theology, and relate those to the, availability, uh, to the available scientific data. So it is, all in all, a theological question, and it is, as such, a foundation for a dialogue between religion and science. How could we apply that here at the school? Well, okay, now I'm going to get on my little soapbox here, but I would say, first off, we need more classes in religion and ecology. If the point is that we have to reflect on this as a religious community, and, well, SU is a Jesuit school. Um, one way that we can do that is by actually teaching religion and ecology and trying to figure out how we can also teach future religious leaders <clears throat> on questions of religion and ecology. I also think that it would be important here at this school to develop a research program in theology and science, and that should have an emphasis uh, on, ecological, on the ecological crisis. It shouldn't be the only emphasis, but it should be an important one. And, and the school here is actually very well placed for that. I mean, you have in Berkeley the Center for the Theology and the Natural Sciences. You have, you're, you're in Silicon Valley, right? So that would be an important research program, I think, that the school has to develop. Of course, that is somewhat costly, but I think it's worth it. Very practically, foster co-taught classes. Um, it's very difficult to teach co-taught co classes here at this campus because of our um, commitment to the core. And that's good, but I think there should be abilities uh, for us as faculty to teach together. So if you have people from the Religious Studies Department, for example, teach together with people from the Environmental Studies Department, those classes could actually, right? We should do that, right? Let's talk, yeah, no, I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for that, yeah. 
So that's, that's, that's something we should actually do. I mean, it's, it's little stuff, but I think it's very important stuff when it comes to how we deal with this here at the school. And then, of course, reach out with the knowledge, with the understanding, with the theological um, reflections that are generated here at the school to the greater community, right? That's the Bay Area. The second point that I wanted to talk sorry. The second point that I want to talk about is then religion as a mediator to transformation. Well, what do I mean by transformation? Uh, in July, I was in Paris at a conference, Our Common Future on Climate Change, and it was really interesting. It was a scientific conference, and what you saw immediately emerge from the conversations, mostly people there were authors of, of um, the uh, report that um, the panel gave out last, when was it, in 2014, 13? And what they were discussing there was, was interesting. <laughs> the question for everyone there was, how can we deal with meaning and value? I mean, we know what the science is, but now we have to move on and we have to somehow get people on board and the science will just not do it. You cannot tell people about information, about the data, and, and hope that they will actually apply those and then say, oh yeah, that, that is actually good. I need to, to change because um, look around what you ate tonight. You ate pizza and probably a lot of you felt like, oh, I shouldn't have a second piece and boom, there goes the second piece. We often do that, that we against our better knowledge act how we shouldn't. So what we need to do is actually we need to somehow bring about an existentialist change. People have to understand and internalize existentially that this is a problem that needs to be addressed and that something else has to be done. So the question is really then how religions can in general and individual faith traditions in particular contribute to an overall societal transformation to sustainable futures, right? So if indeed the ecological crisis is a theological issue, which I think, then that should be easy at least for, for, for religious people, right? If it's a spiritual crisis, where unsustainable lifestyles constitute a personal separation of the believing individual from the transcendent or sacred, well, then it becomes a religious existential to mandate, an, uh, I'm sorry, a religious existential mandate to restore the relationship through an appropriate adjustment of individual and collective behavior. In other words, if from a religious perspective, from a theological perspective, we say, yes, this is a problem, okay, we, we, we have an issue here that is of a theological nature, then there is good motivation for, th for believers to do something about it, and it's an existential um, motivation. Fair enough. What about non-believers? Let's say that all religions possess a vast experience in how to mediate such transformation. There is a long tradition in mediating personal transformation, inter internal transformation, and that could actually then be used also for uh, societal change. Now, I, I admit that the religions don't necessarily have the best track record in that. I, I admit that. But there is a lot of experience, and I think that can be applied also to conversations with non-religious people. For us, what could that mean here? One way that we can do that, actually, would be that we engage students, faculty, staff, and university government in greener behavior. I know, that sounds kind of a greener behavior. I, I think of, of, of really little things here. I, I think of something like a lights off initiative. Um, I don't know how, how you feel about that, but it's frustrating how many times, in, in Canada when I want to use the restroom, I have to walk along the whole corridor of Canada and I don't know how many times I have to go that corridor, go into empty classrooms, turn off the light. It's little things. And I know this sounds like baby steps. I mean, this is stuff that I work with um, with my four year old, right? But it's important stuff and I don't know why we can't do it, but we should. Um, it also means that we offer workshops, I think, and retreats jointly organized by perhaps the Center for Sustainability and Marculus Center and the campus ministry. But it doesn't have to be necessarily aimed at a religious or religiously motivated retreat. But what we should do there is reflect on questions like the common good from a perspective of common concerns. Now, we heard earlier that it's very difficult to talk about these issues when you have people come from different ends and it feels like, okay, you have these opinions vis-a-vis -vis each other and there's a lot of fights, but nothing really transpires. At the end, everybody leaves with the same opinion. Uh, usually that's because we start with the uh, 
with, with, the, with the questions that uh, separate us rather than the questions that brings us together. I think the common concern could be a very good in into that issue. So if you think about talking with students about fear about their future, if you talk with people about the fear for their children, those are good starting places no matter what your, what your perspective is. I mean, it might be that you're afraid for your children because you think the economy has gone down to hell in a handbasket, so therefore we shouldn't do anything about this. Or you can say, I believe the climate has gone uh, to hell in a handbasket. But then you have a level of a, a place from where to engage a conversation. And we should foster this here with our students and faculty. Two minutes. <laughs> Good one. Okay. Uh, last one that I want to talk about is really religion and science and politics. So what are the practical implications of the previous considerations for religion? Well, I think aside from altering personal beliefs and behavior, the societal transformation towards sustainable lifestyles requires a fundamental restructuring of the parameters of the societal system, including technological, economic, cultural, institutional, and political ones. And what is needed then would be an open, ongoing, continuous dialogue between religious representatives, scientific specialists on climate change, and on potential coping strategies like engineers, as well as governmental representatives involved in environmental questions with a long-term goal of affecting governance. Now, we can do this here at SCU. We can have regular, if you want, roundtable meetings. And in those roundtable meetings, what we could do, we have representatives of the religious tradition. That's very easy here at the school from the natural science and engineering and from the government of the school. And why would we want to have that on a regular base? Because I think what is really important is to exactly work on the question of meaning, the question of values, and how those can be actually translated into actions. And that would address a lot of things that we heard before. But again, I mean, I'm a theologian. I'm not a, that, that's, my, that's my perspective here. I think, uh, of course, that can also be done as I said before, in, um, in the Bay Area. Now, divestments, I will, I will not say much about that. I think I will hold off on that when we come to the discussion here, to the bottom discussion. So that makes me stop on time, I think. All right, thank you. Lastly, I would like to invite Dr. John Farnsworth to take the podium. He's a senior lecturer in the SU Department of Environmental Studies and Sciences, studying literary natural history and Anglo-American nature writing. In his spare time, he uh, dabbles in historical ecology, environmental rhetoric, and the history of environmental thought. He um, also consults naturally, nationally on education um, for sustainability at a university level. Dr. John Farnsworth. Thank you, Sean. <clears throat> First of all, I see some faces that I've been seeing here all day. If you've been here since 9 o'clock this morning, raise your hand. Jason, oh. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, I want to really call out one person who's uh, who has chaired this uh, when Father Ng came up with the idea in June to put on a conference in November, which meant we had to meet all summer. He called on Dr. David Dacos, who has actually been wearing a tie now for two days. David. <laughs> because of David, I've now read the encyclical twice. The first time was the day it came out. Three of us, David, Ed Maurer, and I, decided to download it when it came out at noon Rome time, which was 3 a.m. Santa Clara time, and read it that day, and then write an article about it and have it published by 5 o'clock that night. That was not my idea. I had a more leisurely reading of it with a faculty reading group um, that for the last six weeks has taken one chapter a week um, to go through and really digest. Uh, we had 20 faculty that, that came forward that wanted to do this. 
And I asked my group to, uh, to really look and see what, what did the encyclical say about things like sustainability. I can report now, being one of the few people in the universe who have read the encyclical twice, that the encyclical does not say that Jesuit universities in California should divest of fossil fuels. We may be able to apply some of its principles, but it didn't make that easy for us. Now, I have a bias, and let me just tell you what that is. Here's what I wish the encyclical had said. It would have made it easier for me. Am I leaning over? Can you hear me? I'll do it this way better. Last week, I was in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, for a meeting of AISHI, the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. The fellow who keynoted that, David Orr, who came here and spoke to us during our sustainability initiative a few years back, an old friend of mine, said the coolest thing that I wish the Pope had said. He said, large endowments are of no use on a ruined planet. Large endowments are of no use on a ruined planet. Wouldn't that be cool if the Pope had said that? He didn't. He did say a few things that are challenged us as a university. Certainly things that have challenged me as a professor and just as a, you know, person. I want to throw one challenge to the fossil-free SCU people. So I'm going to throw this to you first, because I think he's going to challenge all of us with Laudato Si. Here's what he says. We need to stop thinking in terms of interventions to save the environment in favor of policies developed and debated by all interested parties. I don't know what that says to you, Marisa and Blair. These are two of my former students, so I, I get to, I know they're well trained. Um, it seems to me the Pope is saying, let's, let's go macro, let's go bigger, let's get more radical. We had one speaker early this morning, um, Dr. Ramanathan, who suggested that we need to move beyond symbolic actions. That was a question that uh, Katie, uh, Katie asked there, right? Um, and you might want to re, re send that to us tonight, but What do you think the Pope's saying here? And is that a challenge for SCU, fossil, for fossil-free SCU? You let me know. Now, there are two things that he says that I think we might be able to apply to the question of divestment. This is from the fifth chapter, which is really where he's talking about taking action. Um, and it's a section on politics and economy and dialogue for human fulfillment. And this comes from two successive paragraphs, and in two readings of the encyclical, this is the closest I found that might apply to our question about divestment. Number one, he said, the Pope says, efforts to promote a, a sustainable use of natural resources are not a waste of money, but rather an investment capable of providing other economic benefits in the medium term. Now, although he never says divest uses that word, in the, at least in the English translation of the encyclical. There are 12 places in the encyclical that talk about investing. And in this particular one, he's talking about an investment that provides other economic returns. In other words, suppose it's possible for us to invest our endowment in a way that, that allows us to do what we need to do as a university, right? I believe with Michael Ng, our president, he says the world needs Santa Clara University. And I, I think that's right. And so the endowment does a great thing by allowing us to do what we do, whether that's scholarships, whether that's new facilities, whatever that. But suppose there's a way that it could also provide for the greater good at the same time. In other words, we still get the benefit financially as a university, but that it works for good. A friend of mine I, I had a, a private conversation with uh, last week in Milwaukee, Dr. Anthony Cortesi, who started a thing called Second Nature in 1992. He co-founded that with uh, Senator 
John Kerry at the time, now the Secretary of State. And he's really one of the, in, in, in my field, uh, education for sustainability, he's one of the thought leaders throughout the last 30 years. Um, Tony came up with the idea of the American College and Universities President's climate commitment. Our university signed onto that. It was actually Father Locatelli, who this center is named after. Um, Tony left Second Nature a couple years ago to start a new thing called um, the Intentional Endowment Network. And the whole point of what he's doing now is trying to get universities with large endowments to look at intentional ways that they can invest their endowments and still make the same kind of profit they're making and yet accomplish good in terms of the environment. And it takes us a step further than just say, well, here's the things we shouldn't do, whether that's things like apartheid or invest in companies with, that use sweatshop labor or uh, invest in fossil fuels. fuels. Rather than just saying, well, let's not do the, the negative, it's saying, what can we do as a positive with the billions and billions and billions of dollars that universities have in endowments? We're in the top 10% now in this country. Yeah, we're not anywhere like Harvard or Stanford or Yale or those big guys. But we got a lot of money that can accomplish a lot of good things. Now, that's what Tony Cortese was, wants us to do. What about the Pope? Here's, here's the clincher speaking now on behalf of the Pope. <laughs> he says in the, in, the, in the paragraph that follows the one I just read from, for example, a path of productive development which is more creative and better directed could correct the present disparity between excessive technological investment in consumption and insufficient investment in resolving urgent problems facing the human family. Now that's a clear guideline to say where we should be investing is not in consumption, but in resolving urgent problems facing the human family. Now I gotta look at that as a private citizen. You know, I'm four years from retirement. I'm trying to build up my retirement funds right now, right? I'm probably invested in consumption. I used to be invested in Apple. And then a guy told me I had to diversify. I bought into Apple at $20 a share. Uh, yeah. So this guy told me that I should invest in, in, a, in a blue chip company, and he suggested Gillette because people always are going to shave. <laughs> and I listened to them. But you know, that's kind of like consumption, right? That's, that's, so instead of me investing my retirement nest egg in consumption, it seems like what the Holy Father wants me to do is put my money, my hard earned money, my IRA into resolving urgent problems facing the human family. Whew. All right, well, okay. So the Pope is clearly saying, don't invest in consumption. That's a bad investment. Invest in problem resolution. That's a good investment. Now, what is the biggest form of consumption our society has? These are all my students in the front. This is a good question. Raise your hands. What is the biggest form of consumption we have right now? They're freshmen. They take a little longer. <laughs> Fossil fuels, right? That's the ultimate consumable because that's something we consume we don't get back. And so when he says don't invest in consumption, I think we can say as a moral guideline, a moral guideline according to what you were saying, Oliver, that, that we should not be uh, investing in consumption. I think I've got it all here. 
My assumption here is that there is no greater way of investing in consumption than investing in the extraction of fossil fuels. Gas, oil, and coal are ultimately consumer products. We can invest in better things. Thank you, Dr. Farnsworth. Next, I'd like to invite Blair Libby to uh, respond to the comments that have been put forward by our three faculty members. Blair Libby is a senior environmental science major and religious studies minor. He is an excellent drummer and uh, also is the head of Fossil Free SCU and Be Legit. Fossil Free SCU is the a uh, group on campus that is agitating for um, divestment, and Be Legit is the SCAP program that focuses on environmental justice. Blair Libby, everyone. Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. I see a lot of familiar faces. This is good. <laughs> Um, so this is mostly a secular response that I've prepared because I have written some things down. Um, but I want to thank Oliver because it's clear that our spiritual connection to the earth, the land, just kind of nature in general, um, is a very necessary dialogue. And it's something that we should think about in every aspect of our lives, especially when it comes to the ecological crisis and speaking on things, especially like divestment. And this is very obvious in the entire document of Laudato Si', but... Um, I'm very happy about the things you brought up. Thanks. Uh, so to start off, I'd like to share a few quotations, a few short ones from Laudato Si. First, young people demand change. Unless citizens control political power, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. In the absence of pressure from the public and from civil institutions, political authorities will always be reluctant to intervene. Now, I think it's clear from these quotes that the underlying theme of the encyclical, which has also been reiterated in a number of ways through our panelists here and the rest of the people who have spoken up here today, is that there's a need to produce both a cultural and ethical shift through taking action. And as students of this university, all of us, most of us in this room see students, um, our micro-political authority is the administrative body, the board of trustees. And we are compelled to show administration that we as students and the lifeblood of this institution demand a just and sustainable future. And that's why we have a divestment campaign, fossil fuel divestment. We strive to remove ourselves from an extractive economy, which John was just referencing. These are stagnant policies with, yet with uncontrolled growth, but stagnant policies and they keep uh, perpetuating the same kinds of policies that don't really go anywhere, right? <laughs> and the Pope calls for us to reject these, and he calls them a magical conception of the market where problems can be solved simply by an increase in profits. Uh, and this system, this extractive economy, is also ignorant of our religious values, these shared moral standards for good and to do good to our neighbors and the planet that we've been given as a gift. Divestment, as a keystone of a broader climate justice movement, supports a just transition into a living economy, one that creates truly equitable democracy in allowing stakeholders, not only shareholders, to decide how to interact with the ecology of a place. We strive for environmental justice, which works to marginalization of certain communities, which are generally the poor and people of color. And uh, that's why this isn't an intervention, John, to answer your question. So with our current policies and in investing in fossil fuels, as we are doing at Santa Clara, we're contributing to this destructive social system of an extractive economy, one that makes no room for moral victories, only profitable victories. And after meetings with administration, it's evident that the first step is to review our guidelines for socially responsible investment, which is a set of standards that our university put in place years ago. And it's the economic reasoning for how we use our endowment. First, we are directly disobeying our own guidelines. For the same reasons that we divested from Massey Energy back in 2009, I believe, uh, which was environmental and social negligence, we should also divest from the rest of fossil fuel companies. There is no difference. And secondly, if a fund manager promises that our commingled funds do not include firearms, alcohol, and tobacco companies, which is promised us by SU administration and confirmed, then why can't a fund, man fund manager 
for a commingled fund also remove fossil fuels, which was stated in the email from last June as a primary reason for our university unable to divest. So with these two accounts, um, among many others, it's obvious that our investment practices are using loopholes in the wording of this document that not let out to see the document, the socially responsible investment guidelines, uh, to get away with funding the truly, truthfully, the greatest threat humankind has ever known, climate change. They're not in line with the core values of Laudato Si, and we should all be concerned of this fact. And that's why it's time to make profound changes, a sustainable, long-lasting movement, this non-interventionalist type of work, um, in SCU's decision-making and overall culture. And that's starting with how we invest, hence fossil fuel divestment. And I'll end this with, as the Pope writes, it's a quote, human beings, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing a good what is good, choosing again what is good, and making a new start. So my question to the panel is, how do we take the lessons from the encyclical and these things that you've been discussing so eloquently, and the direct commands that the Pope has issued us to draft a new set of guidelines to begin this cultural and ethical shift that I'm discussing. And specifically for Oliver, I'm wondering, as a theologian, how do you believe that the Jesuit community, our resident Jesuits on campus, we have so many, um, how, how do we get them involved in the movement and just at least in this dialogue that we want to become more prevalent on our campus through all different communities, not just students? And to Chad, how do we better articulate these demands to the Board of Trustees? Demands from this, this base of people power and not basing everything off this idea of a monolithic, top-down sort of system. That's my response. Thank you. Analyst, would you care to respond to Blair's Test, test. Okay, there it is. Thanks a lot. Those were great points. Um, how to get the Jesuits involved? I think um, exactly through the first point that I was, of the three that I kind of discussed there, highlighting that it is a theological issue. Because um, everything else, I think, follows from there. Um, and there, there are numerous way of, ways of how this is a theological issue. I mean, the, the texts. The, encyclical talks about it. I mean, you can start this from the question of uh, doctrine of creation, right? I mean, you can, you can ask the question whether how we treat this creation is actually how we should create it, uh, how we should treat it. Um, that leads us right into the question of theological anthropology. What is the human being? I'm, 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 I'm always very, uh, very careful when it comes to the idea of the image of God. I, th I think that's a very tricky category, but and, and for, for, for complex reasons, so I, I don't want to go into that, but are we as human beings in a particular responsibility towards this creation? And, and are we living up to that? And I think those theological questions can be addressed from various angles uh, by the Jesuits here in terms of how the ministry is organized and run. Uh, and how classes in theology are being taught. I mean, there, there are various uh, ways how that can be done. And I, what I would like to see, and that's, that's what, I, what I meant about the educational part there, what I would like to see is really a, 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 strong, impetus, a strong emphasis of theology and science. And of course, I mean, that's my field, so you have to apologize, but, you know, it's kind of selfish, but to put an emphasis on that because you need to not only understand from a theological perspective, you need not only understand the science behind it in order to evaluate it properly, or the theology, but you need to understand how to relate the two in such a way that it's actually productive. And, and that, that would be, I think, a way of how we can get the Jesuits involved and how we can bring that also then into religious education here. Uh, so your, your question for me was um, how to go back to the Board of Trustees. I'm going to rephrase it a little bit because um, this is how I want to talk about it. But how to go back to the Board of Trustees, you'll see, you'll, you'll see why. Um, 
And I guess what I would suggest is to go back to the Board of Trustees and, and say, um, we hear your first response, and we're gonna treat it as a first response. Um, and we think that it's in keeping with the university's educational mission to continue a dialogue here. Um, we have some additional questions, like the question you raised. Why has it been possible to um, identify uh, and remove uh, certain kinds of stocks from commingled funds, um, but not these kinds of stocks? So we, we have some factual questions. We want to know more. Um, and we want to continue to engage in a dialogue that um, keeps open our exploration of this issue so that when someone responds to you with what seems to be a closed-ended answer, no, you say, wait a second, we still have a dialogue to have here, right? And that's very much part of this university's mission, to have that dialogue. Um, I was a uh, college student during the 1980s, and I learned an enormous amount about South Africa, the global economy, and how universities work from the divestment movement that was active then. I've also learned a lot from you guys um, about fossil fuel investments and about how our university works. So it seems to me that um, what you're doing is helping to educate the community by having this discussion and that coming back and saying, this dialogue shouldn't be over, this dialogue should continue, and we have some questions to, to get it going again uh, would be a valuable thing to do. Just very briefly, um, Blair, you're asking strategic questions, and the fossil free movement has really been a student initiative. Um, you're way ahead of the faculty on this, so I don't know why you'd want to ask for faculty advice at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Keep leading. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you. I would now like to invite Marissa Rudolph to come up and talk about her own response to, the, to what we've heard so far. Marissa is a sophomore environmental science and political science double major. She's on the cross country team and she's the vice president of the Green Club. Marissa. Hey guys, how's it going? Um, so as we've heard many times today, Santa Clara University's mission promises that it will educate citizens and leaders to build a more humane, just, and sustainable world. This is exactly what Pope Francis is asking us to do in the encyclical. But if we as a university were fulfilling this promise, then we wouldn't be sitting here today. Is it easy to fulfill this promise? No. We don't have the answers to the encyclical, and we do take part in actions such as social entrepreneurship, which is effective, but only if it is paired with other integrated efforts. Radical change at our university is critical to respond to the degradation occurring on many levels. I agree with John that interventions are not doing enough to respond to the environmental crisis at hand, but that is exactly what the university is doing and what us as students and our uh, faculty allies are attempting to expand beyond. SCU has taken great leaps in sustainability. On our beautiful campus, we live so-called sustainable lives because we compost, we use recycled water for landscaping, and we partially run off of renewable energy. But we present these accomplishments as if using green rhetoric to make it appear as if that's everything we could be doing. Um, but we are, as students, are challenging the university to rise above this. Um, these immediate actions to make a larger impact on our community as a whole. These interventions are an important push in the right direction, but as Pope Francis says, ecological culture cannot be reduced to a series of urgent and partial responses. These needs to be a dis there needs to be a distinctive way of looking at things. That is what we, as student activists, aim to do, create a culture where sustainability is a way of life. But we need the university's help. We ask the university to divest, not only because removing funds from coal, fossil fuel, and oil takes power away from these companies, but also because it tells every member of the SCU community that we are responding to the Pope's call to address this moral issue of the highest level. Like Professor Raphael said, um, divestment is just a starting point. We need to curb consumption. But divestment is also a symbol, 
that will show that SEU is detaching itself from the chains of the free market and the technocratic paradigm that allows the economy to rule our actions. Where our money lies says a lot about who we are. If SEU is willing to take such a dramatic action, even if administrators claim it is not the best fiscal decision at the moment, it sets the precedent that SEU is willing to not let economic power rule our moral decisions. We need to stop believing that depending on the market will keep this university great. Instead, we should look to the Pope and other thoughtful leaders of conscience to live up to the expectations being presented to us and the promises we've made to ourselves. We need to be willing to sacrifice and change to repay our ecological debt and stand in solidarity with the poor, as our Jesuit roots ask us to do. If the university continues to act upon the Pope's words, SEU will be communicating to its students, faculty, and staff that living sustainability is not a convenient buzzword that they throw out, but an expectation of moral fiber concerning environmental degradation. We, as student activists, ask that SEU take this radical step or, as Oliver Putz put it, fundamental restructuring of holding every person in our community accountable. So my question for the panelists is, as professors and respected experts in your field, you're in a unique position to directly influence both the administration and the students to create an integrated community on campus. How can you use this to respond to the Pope's call to create a radical change in SCU's culture surrounding sustainability? <laughs> well, I think we need to, is that on? I think we need to figure out what it means to be radical because um, it's a lot easier not to be and certainly reading Laudato Si the Pope is calling for a new kind of radicalness uh, we need to decide is, is that where we want to be do we want to radically commit to the remediation of climate change. A few years ago when we signed on to a, a climate action plan, that seemed pretty radical. But that's not right now. That's, I mean, a lot of, 800 universities have already done that. And we're trying to be the leaders and they keep pulling ahead of us. So I think that, that question is, is relevant to us. If we want to be leaders in the conversation about justice and sustainability, how radical are we ready to get? And I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm in. So I guess I understand radical um, not as uh, um, left, right, or um, how extreme the actions are that you're willing to take, but the original kind of root meaning, which is, um, are you willing to get down to the roots of the problem? Right? What are the root causes of the problem? Um, and are you willing to try to address those root causes? So, so one thing that we do, I, I think that's very important, is in our classes, and, and I think your question is asking, is kind of pushing me to start thinking myself, for myself, am I really, in my classes, encouraging students to get down to the root causes of our problems? Um, and identify them? Or am I kind of skimming along the surface, right? Um, so I, I appreciate that challenge. Um, something that I'm gonna take home with me tonight. And as I look at my syllabi, I think about, am I providing enough opportunities for students to, to, you know, by keep asking why, why is this happening? Where is this coming from? That we can really get down to, to what we see as the root causes of the problems that we're facing so that we can imagine what we could do about them. Um, yeah, I think that's my initial response. Um, so when I teach a class on religion and the ecological crisis, I usually do the first five days of it just purely science. And it's, it's kind of funny, students who come on the second day of the class usually look around and ask whether they're in the right class because it's really just science and it's a religion class. The reason why I do that is I want to put the fear of, well, not God, but of climate change into them, of the ecological crisis because the data is, is huge. But I also know that really doesn't do anything because I have students who tell me after that I still will use plastic bottles because it's more convenient. Um, so just the data is really not the important thing. I think and what we have to, what we really have to allow as professors, not only in our conversations during class but beyond the classroom is to ask the question of meaning. 
and, and it, it sounds like an old record and a broken one at that, but I really think, you know, I mean, meaning is what it really comes down to. People have, that there's nothing as important for us as human beings as that. So, in how far can we, how far can we construct, or, or no, not construct, how far can we facilitate a conversation about meaning, about values, in light of, yeah, of the scientific data, of the question that is at hand. And how can we go, <laughs> how radical can we go from there on in? Go on in, I mean, full, full force, I'm with you, I'm, I'm right there. Um, I'm, but also in the sense, as you said, radical as the root, the root issue. I mean, what is the root cause of this problem? But also, how can we, you know, for me as a, as a theologian, how can we perhaps address this from a theological root? How can we address that question as a response from a theological root? So what would be a good re theological response to that? Great, thank you. I would now like to open up this conversation to the community. Um, if you'd like to ask any questions of the panelists or bring your own, or uh, mention your own comments. I ask you to keep them brief, um, but we will now go around, uh, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll go from there. Would you like to, it's microphone coming up to you. I'm Chako Narot, a community member. There has been significant talk here about divestiture. First, I have multiple questions here, they're all short. How much is the total promised divestiture so far? I believe it is nothing insignificant. It's a very large number. Anybody has a number? Just at Santa Clara or, or Jimmy? No, 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 all over. It, it oh. is very large number of billions. Oh, you, you mean com completely? I mean, yes. It, yes. It is, it is it's know, a snowball know. effect, it is gathering momentum very rapidly. I don't know what so, uh, it doesn't matter, we can Google it later. Se 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 second, one of the reasons that the late comers to the divestiture is giving is, is uh, a potential risk of not divesting because these stocks may come down. So as trustees of the funds or just trustees of board of directors have a responsibility to take that into account. So that that I don't know whether it has already been suggested in your, when you approach the board, so I, I suggest that. I, I don't know that any of us are experts in that. I would note that the Keystone XL company just withdrew its, its petition yeah, that, yesterday and that Shell just withdrew from Arctic drilling and that in the Washington Post yesterday, um, the third quarter for fossil fuel companies is going to be five billion lower than expectations. So we may be talking about a moot point that it's not really that good an investment anymore. Right, right. So, so if it is not that good an investment, it, it's not a reason to keep it going. So I would guess that's true. Okay. <laughs> um, Hi, Stephanie Hughes, Environmental Studies and Sciences. I can follow up a little bit on that, because um, uh, with Fossil Free um, SCU last year, there was a lot of discussion with the administration, and I sat at the table for a few of those, and it was a discussion of stranded assets. That's the term. Yeah, stranded assets. And we brought it up, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't viewed as a real issue at the time, but as... John Farnsworth has said things are changing. The price of a barrel of oil has dropped significantly, and so these things have changed very, very rapidly. When the price of oil goes back up, the pipeline will be back in business, and everything will be, you know, they'll, they'll try to. I just want to also just follow up, make one brief comment to Marissa. Um, for um, you were asking the faculty what we could do as if we have more. Uh, what do we have? We don't have it. <laughs> as, if, uh, as if we have um, um, more um, pull with the administration than 
you guys do and we don't. I don't think we do. So I, we will. We have your backs. We are there with you. But you are the leaders in this, and you will remain the leaders in this. And I thank you. On the stranded assets comment, um, I think that the idea of stranded assets and why we why we use that as a reasoning for why we should divest, um, it kind of goes to the core idea of sustainability, and that when you're looking at um, fossil fuel stocks, they're uh, returns are increasing, but at a decreasing rate, they're starting to plateau. Whereas renewable energies, they're increasing at an increasing rate, so they're getting higher and higher and higher. And eventually, they're going to become more profitable to, to be in renewables over fossil fuels. So when we keep investing in fossil fuels and we recognize them as this stranded asset where it's eventually it's going to become um, obsolete, uh, it goes back to this idea of, is it a sustainable investment? not just environmentally sustainable, but is it going to continue to give us some kind of profit? And the fact of the matter is that it's not. Any other? Will? Hello, uh, my name is Will. I'm a senior here at Santa Clara, and uh, I'm part of the uh, Fossil Free SEU movement. And my question to the panel, I guess, directed a little bit at Professor Farnsworth, because it kind of stems off of something he said. Um, but part of the fossil free SCU movement, I've really kept my ears open uh, reading through the encyclical um, with the Turks and, uh, Cardinal Turks and speech yesterday and uh, all the events I attended today. I like, was keeping my ears open for that word divestment. Um, and it really just did not come up as much as I thought um, that it would or I thought that it should. So I guess my question to the panel is why uh, why, why did Pope Francis choose to leave that out of the encyclical? Why did he not discuss it? You know, he doesn't have to support it, but why didn't he at least discuss it? And why is it so difficult? Why does it seem so difficult to start a discussion on it and get people talking about it and open up that dialogue that Pope Francis wants us to? I suppose you could, you could ask that as a critique of the encyclical. Uh, I, I don't think the Pope is really writing as the CEO of a multinational corporation saying, okay, folks, here's how we're going to do business. I don't, I don't think that was part of his, his thought process in putting that down. Uh, he's really talking about um, ecological conversion, both on an individual level and a societal level. Um, so I think he really intends it more as a moral document than a document to give direction to universities, parishes, dioceses, and so on. But you could say that's a, a critique of it, that he hasn't really said, okay, church, let's, let's say how we're going to put our, how, how we're going to invest in this. I was just going to say, even though I'm not an expert on the Vatican Bank, um, there are some problems there. <laughs> um, one of the major reasons that some think that uh, the previous pope resigned was because of the scandals um, at the bank, and certainly Pope Francis has his hands full trying to reform it. My understanding is that the Australian cardinal, who is his main economic advisor on reforming the bank, um, doesn't put a lot of stock in climate change research, and that, um, you know, that's something that is true of a lot of institutions, that you, the chief financial advisors are not folks who take terribly seriously um, some of the environmental impacts of the investments or even, you know, the research that says that, that climate change is real and happening. Um, so I think that may be part of the challenge there, um, you know, the Vatican Bank. That said, I did see a report this summer that a spokesperson for the Vatican said that uh, it's possible that they would start considering divestment. I have no clue. <laughs> um, it's a very good question, but I, I'm really not entirely sure. I, I would go with you, John. I would, I would say it, 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 the intention of the text was probably more on a moral end. Um, also on a theological. There's, there's some of that in there. Um, quite a bit, actually. Um, and I felt that depending on how you read it, I mean, the, the, the message is in there, the word is not. And so I, I, I think that that's really what we're looking at. But why the word was avoided, I really don't know. Sorry. Not very Thank you. Hi, uh, 
Hi, my name is Katie Diggs. I'm a student here. This morning I asked um, Dr. Ramanathan if he thought divestment would be a necessary and effective step in addressing our climate issues. And he kind of said it would be more of a symbolic step. And I was wondering if you agree with that or if we believe it would have direct impacts. So um, I remember that question and, and I remember his response and I remember he also said, you know, I think it'd be much more powerful to educate yourself and educate other people. And I thought, you know, the two are really not, they're totally connected, right? As I said earlier, um, I think Fossil Free SCU has been one of the most important sources of education um, about this issue on this campus, uh, certainly for me and I think for a bunch of other people as well just by pushing me to start thinking about this issue. So three years ago, somebody came into my office and said, you know, um, a bunch of us are thinking about asking uh, the, the administration to do this, what do you think? And I realized I didn't have a very good answer. I needed to do some research. So just right there, pushing us to start thinking about that, right? Um, so I, I think I would respectfully disagree with the answer that you got. I think that the, the um, Educational value of this is enormous. And I don't think symbolic things are merely symbolic. I think symbolic things are very powerful, mostly because of what I was talking about. Trying to align your values with your actions is how we live lives of integrity as institutions and individuals. And even if we can never do it perfectly, we should never give up on trying. Real shortly, short, K Katie, I'm going to disagree with, with Professor uh, Ram Ramanathan as well. Um, I would say the symbolic is pretty important. And if it's not a symbolic action, then maybe we could take it to the next level and call it sacramental. That there's a tremendous sign value in what we think in, in a Catholic tradition of certain actions. I mean, you've got a whole religion built around that sacramentality. So that could be kind of a sign of our commitment to the environment. It, I think that's important. Um, I would take large offense with the word just. Symbols are important. They're expressions of who and what we are, how we understand ourselves, how we create meaning. So it's not just symbolic. It is symbolic, and that's good. Symbol is something that we need in order to articulate and, and reflect on where we stand, what we want, and, and, and also what it means to us. So I would agree with both of you that that's, that's a very powerful thing. Um, but, um, and, you know, it, it goes along with the things when people say, you know, I, I always tell students two things that I really find entirely frustrating uh, when you teach theology and science is when people say, oh, that's just an interpretation or that's just a theory. That's just as bad. Um, because these things are really, really powerful and, and meaningful. And it is actually with symbols and the tension of the is and is not, of metaphors that we use in order to articulate what, what we try to get as, as, as meaning, that we try to understand, that we really become who we are. If we don't have that, we might as well pack in. Katie, let me also say that I agreed with everything else Dr. Ramanathan <laughs> said today. <laughs> that was the only point where I took issue. <laughs> uh, very briefly, I would even go so far as to say that the divestment movement we can't even call it symbolic. Um, uh, Will and myself and other students here have been to these uh, different trainings around the country and um, for, for divestment campaigns. And they're inspiring in the way that we really understand that divestment isn't just a simply an economic issue, it's not simply an environmental issue, it's so much of a social justice issue. It's about defeating different systems of oppression like patriarchy and white supremacy and um, the very negative aspects of capitalism that kind of plague all these different institutions that we're a part of. Um, 
so I think just us participating and building up this this power of of students and faculty and showing that uh, I was talking about earlier about this equitable democracy. Um, that's not a symbol to me. That's it's very much a movement. All right, we have time for one last question. JC. 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 Yeah, yeah, he's been waving for a while. <laughs> So I'm Julia Clare, JC, and I work in campus ministry. And I want to say, you know, I've had the privilege of working here for about a decade. And in that time, the students I've encountered in Fossil Free SU are some of the most passionate, articulate, and really committed students um, to advocacy. And I really appreciate that. Um, I think I really appreciated what you said, uh, Blair, to Oliver. Like, okay, how, how do you see, um, like, Practically, I think you're really interested in practically how do we advance this cause? And a couple of thoughts that I have. One is, I think, Oliver, to your point, where it's at the intersections of religion and science. I think it's really at, I think we've got some skillfulness there. I think it's really, in order to move this cause forward, it's at the intersections of theology and economics. Because I think that the, the obstacle is we've reached, and I think John really spoke to this, we're at this place where we know what that change would ask. And there's the, okay, well, the concern of like losing the profit that we would lose by divesting the funds. And what I see as being the opportunity, we've heard these amazing talks all day. And one of the really amazing things that we have here at Santa Clara through the Miller Center is all of this innovation in creative ways of investing capital. And how do we learn from the wisdom that's here at this university to be creative about how to create a plan going forward of how we'll invest in a way that's compelling, that takes responsibility for the concern if we divest how that impact our endowment. And I think the more creative that you can be in becoming skillful in a, in a positive solution that you can provide that's at the intersections of you know, social change, theology, economics, and science, bringing those together the more compelling you're, you're going to be. And so that's the one thing that I wanted to say. I think it's not just science and religion. I really think it's at the intersection of economics. The other thing I'll say is just as a staff member working with students, you, you encounter students who are really passionate about things. All, you know, There's always students who become really passionate about something. And I think as a staff member, you really start to appreciate when that becomes a more diffuse movement. And so I would just encourage you I love what Chad said, you know, keep the dialogue open. I think that's in conversation with Laudato Si. But also continue to share and expand um, your influence among your peers to be able to demonstrate. Don't let your experience that, oh, it has to come from the administration. We've got to figure out how to make a difference to the administration or else this isn't, we're not advancing this cause. I think it's just as important to be able to continue to share your commitment with your peers and to kind of um, include more and more of your peers in the dialogue with faculty and with the administration um, in order to really continue that groundswell of movement for change. But I, so that's, I don't have a question. I just want to say all that. And I just really I appreciate all that you've done. And I don't know if anybody wants to just disagree with me or say something different, but I, that's kind of what I see as like something I would recommend for you as you go forward, because I just so acknowledge your passion and your commitment. And that's what I see might make a difference. Jay, I can't, JC, I can't imagine a better way to end this conference than by giving you the final word. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Wonderful. Um, <laughs> thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Mike Hendry, for coming as well. Um, I believe some final thank yous and final remarks as we wrap up this evening. Thanks. I just <coughs> wanted to note, uh, and as Sean said, some thank yous um, going out. Uh, so to Father Ang, and this whole thing was Father Ang's idea. So he really, um, we really need to recognize that, give him a lot of credit for his passion behind all of these topics and definitely his openness to keep talking and pursuing all of these things. And I know this topic as well that we're talking about tonight. Um, also, a thank you to all the members of the organizing committee. Um, John Farnsworth here on the panel, uh, Tom Massaro, Ed Maurer, 
Iris Stewart Fry, Bill Sundstrom, Ken Manister, Lindsey Kalkbrenner, Keith Warner, Pat Haynes, Blair, Libby, and Sean Riley um, for all of their great work and tons of great ideas that uh, really were brought to fruition here. A huge thanks also to Mike Nuttall and Susan Chun of the Ignatian Center for all the logistical work. And thanks also to people all around the university who helped out so much with this, including in the President's Office, Office of Communications and Marketing, Campus Ministry, Facilities, Bon Appetit, the Sustainability Office, the Ethics Center. Um, one just thought, I just the phrase came up, and with the students in the room, the phrase came up earlier of, I think Professor Ramanathan may have said this phrase, or someone did, about students kind of being fired with passion. And um, so that made me think of the great Jesuit uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins' beautiful poem, The Wind Hover, A Hawk Hovering in the Wind, and, and uh, Hopkins sees it and sort of sees in that, in that hawk the sort of fire breaking forth of God's glory in nature. And so a good fitting way, and I was thinking of Father Jack using this phrase a lot, to the students here, to all of us in the face of this challenge, let us go, as Ignatius says, and set fire to the world by our actions. So thank you all.